When you're leading many people, if you've always got to be the one who knows the answer, you become the constriction in the pipe because your team can only advance as quickly as your own knowledge allows. So this is where the curiosity and listing comes in. Instead of being focused on knowing the answer, great leaders are those who are focused on asking the important questions. Welcome to 20 Minute Leaders. Just sit back, relax, and learn from the leaders of today. It's a journey. Each one is different, unique, inspiring. Let's get started. This episode is powered by Jay Ventures, a community-driven VC fund in Silicon Valley in partnership with Leumitech, sponsored by Homeward Ventures, Hippo Insurance, Opus Labs, Synergy Global, Hillel at Stanford, Leap, Birthright Excel, Serona Partners, and in media partnership with C-Tech. Let's learn how to lead from the jump seat. Meet Peter Docker. Peter teaches people how to navigate the challenge of leadership. His latest book, Leading from the Jump Seat, delivers the message that leadership is about lifting people up and giving them the space they need to so that when the time is right, they can take the lead. Co-author of Find Your Why and formerly a founding igniter at Simon Sinek Inc., Peter draws on his 25-year career in the Royal Air Force and over 14 years spent partnering with businesses around the world to inspire others to lead from the jump seat. To learn more about Leading from the Jump Seat, go to leadingfromthejumpseat.com. Peter, I, I have to start out, you know, just understanding a little bit about, you know, why, why focus, you know, and why dedicate your career to this question of leadership? You know, how, where does this stem from? You know, some people want to be firemen when they grow up. Some mm. people want to have, you know, they have, they have different specializations and jobs and you dedicate your career to harnessing human potential and human talent and helping others. Where does that really come from for you? Well, it's not like I set out to do that, Michael. You know, I think uh, for many years, particularly the 25 years I was in the Royal Air Force, um, it's just something that I did, but not that intentionally, if you see what I mean. You know, we're focused on uh, the work that we were doing. I was a pilot. Uh, I led people in combat um, and other interesting situations, shall we say. But it wasn't as if I was thinking specifically about leadership at the time. But it's only later on in life that I've had the opportunity to sit back and reflect and identify those times when it didn't go quite so well, as well as the times that really did fly well and codify it. And also I've had the opportunity over the past, what, 10, 15 years uh, since leaving the Air Force to, well, visit 93 countries and work with leadership teams from companies in practically every sector you can imagine. So my curiosity has kept me alive and helped to inform what I see as great leadership mm -hmm. and when it doesn't work so well either. Right. And so where are you more curious about the way that it, what makes great leadership or what makes it not work so well? Well, First of all, I don't think there is any such thing as a perfect leader. You know, in my book, Leading from the Jump Seat, I mention a few times when I certainly did not get it right. And in some ways, I thought, oh, if only I knew what I knew now. But of course, it's by making those mistakes that we actually learn, provided we remain curious and provided we remain reflective and focus less on the individual data points, but more on the overall trend where are we sourcing ourselves from? You know, mm. are we sourcing ourselves from a place of fear or a place of love, ultimately, which I know gets people a bit twitchy in a business environment when I mention about love. But when we are um, sourcing ourselves from a place of love, we're looking at the world as a place of possibility and opportunity. We're looking at the chance to lift people up rather than focusing on ourselves. And we suppress that ego so it doesn't get in the way, you know? So that's what I mean by leading from love. And that's what's really important to source ourselves from that place rather than fear. And also to go a little bit easy on ourselves when we don't get it right. You know, as I say, it's the overall trend over time that's important rather than any one specific data point where we might not have got it quite right. Yeah. You know? Curiosity and reflectivity. Mm. Two things that you mentioned in the beginning here. 
you know, what, what do we know about them? What, what have you understood about curiosity and reflectivity? And, and, and where in your life did this come about where you really understood that these two elements are, are some of the most crucial elements to become effective leaders on an ongoing basis and not just in, in very specific moments? Well, I think one of the key aspects of the great leaders that I've known, and I've worked, had the privilege of working with many, is that they listen. And you can only listen properly if you're curious about something. And so the great leaders I've worked with, they've been curious about my view, about my perception of a situation and what I can contribute. And that curiosity has them listen intensely to their people and it empowers their people. And here's the thing. Often we are, well, our, our whole system, when we go through school, college, we are rewarded by knowing the answer. Yeah? You're a specialist in your field and you become a specialist because you get good at a certain area and you, you're the go-to person, you know the answer. But here's the thing, when you're leading many people, if you've always got to be the one who knows the answer, you become the constriction in the pipe because your team can only advance as quickly as your own knowledge allows. So this is where the curiosity and listening comes in. Instead of being focused on knowing the answer, Great leaders are those who are focused on asking the important questions and feeling confident to lead when they don't know the answer. Because when you're confident to lead in that situation, you are no longer that constriction in the pipe. And instead, you're leaning into your people, your team, and that collective genius who can step up and contribute to figuring out the answers that you need. And that is why I think curiosity and the ability to really listen to the answers to the questions that you ask is so important in any leader. Now, is this something that can be trained or taught, you know, to be curious, the art of being curious? Because what it sounds to me is that it's not enough to just say, yes, I want to know more, but, it, but there, you have to have it. And a really intrinsic motivation to understand and a wanting to understand, especially when, you know, you think, you know, the answer, but, but you really do want to know what the other person is thinking, yeah. even though you're sure you're right. Is this something that really I can train myself to do better? Yes, I think it is. And it starts with self-reflection. You know, um, I, I start the book by taking a deep dive into figuring out what is really important to us as individuals. I'm not talking about latest, you know, iPhone or whatever it happens to be or paycheck. No, what is deeply important to you? Now, for many of us, that's family. But when we start to dig deeper, there are other things that we can identify that are very important to us. For me, uh, the choices I made while I went to university to study the subjects I did, the reason I studied those subjects was because my parents were had both lost their jobs and were very hard up, and I wanted to be able to get a good job to support them and also not to be a burden on them. So that was one key thing that was revealed as something deeply important to me. There's something else that happened as well, which revealed uh, another aspect which is deeply important to me, which is the notion of mutual respect. Now, the reason that it's so valuable to identify those deeply important things to you is that it builds a reservoir of energy that helps you to step forward even into the unknown. I'll give you an example. I mentioned family. A couple of years ago, I had a call from my wife and she'd been involved in a car accident. I dropped everything. There was nothing that was going to get in my way to going and supporting my wife. Now, I didn't know what I would find. I stepped into the unknown, but I was absolutely committed to moving forward. And it's that energy that help build that momentum to go and support my wife, no questions asked. And so when we identify those other choices that we've made in life, which collectively show us what's deeply important to us, it gives us that energy to move forward. And this is where it links in to the curiosity piece. If we are deeply passionate about certain things, those handrails that guide us even in the unknown, then we are naturally likely to become curious because we want to learn as much as we can to solve the challenges in front of us. And when we have that link to that passion, it suppresses something else as well, which is important. It suppresses ego, because ego can get in our way. 
And instead, we can learn to lead with what I call humble confidence. And that is what we need when we are curious mm. and we're comfortable not knowing the answer, but absolutely focused on asking the important questions. Where do we see this humbled confidence in today's world? What are some examples, either with specific people or organizations that you've observed, you know, figures that really embody this idea of humbled confidence? Well, um, let's go large. You know, there's a company that I write quite extensively about uh, called ASOS. And ASOS is a British company. Uh, it is in the fashion retail business. They are huge. Yeah, they've got something like um, 400,000 products available online. They distribute to over 200 countries and territories. Every day they add 5,000 products to uh, their website. You know, this is big. And until pretty recently, the CEO, the guy in charge, is a chap called Nick Bainton. And Nick is an example of everything that I write about in the book. And he displays humble confidence. So what is humble confidence? Humble confidence, as the word suggests, is first of all, let's look at the confidence side. It's about being confident in your own strengths, absolutely resolute about where you're going with your team, your organization, your company, whilst um, also being ready to make the decisions when they need to be taken. But then the humble side of it comes in. It's having the humility to listen to others having the humility to recognize that we don't have the, all the answers, but seeing that as a strength rather than a weakness. And this is how Nick Bainton over the years, he was with the company about 15, I think, grew it from a very small company to a multi-billion dollar uh, consortium across the world. And uh, he did this by lifting up his own people, by empowering them. And this is a key tenant of what I call jump seat leadership. You know, leadership, Jump seat leadership is not about retaining or growing your own power. It's about lifting others up and empowering them. So when the time is right, they can take the lead. And that takes a large degree of humble confidence. What is the most challenging piece of doing exactly what you mentioned, you know, re not retaining, not holding all the power to you, mm -hmm. but, 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 and, but, you know, harnessing it for others and making sure that they're leveraged to, to leverage this power and to grow themselves and become their own individual leaders. What, what is the most challenging piece of it? And I'm asking this, you know, as from the lens of a young entrepreneur looking to build my own team pretty soon uh, in, in a startup scene. And I want all of them to be their own leaders as well. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest challenge, I've already mentioned the word, it's ego. You know, uh, <laughs> you're, you're calling mm. me from, from Cyprus at the moment, and many speak Greek, and ego is Greek for I. And ego is generated when fear is triggered. Now, fear is triggered when our life is in danger, and it does a good job. You know, it saves, it saves us from uh, the oncoming vehicle because we jump out of the way. But fear is also triggered when our livelihood, our status, or our reputation feels under threat. And when it's triggered because of one of those three reasons, often the reaction can be ego. We close down. We start seeing the world not as a place of opportunity, but as a place of scarcity, where I've got to win at all costs, no matter anything else. It's where we stop thinking about other people, and we're focusing right. on ourselves alone. And the trouble with ego when it's generated by fear, because we feel our livelihood status or reputation is on the line, is that it's not sustainable. Fear, acting from fear is not sustainable. But there is an option. And that option is we always have the choice to choose love, to choose humble confidence. Humble confidence is the antidote to ego. Yeah. And because it comes from a place of love, it is sustainable. It will keep us going even when times are difficult, even when times are very tight. You know, another entrepreneur, Elon Musk, um, when he started SpaceX, you know, he started in 2006, he launched his first rocket, it exploded 33 seconds after takeoff. He had another go in 2007, another explosion, 2008, more explosions. <coughs> Excuse me. Fourth attempt, it flew. But then on his birthday in 2015, another explosion where he lost two payloads for NASA. But here's the thing, 
He said, when something is important enough, you will do it anyway, even when the odds are not in your favor. And this links back to what we we're saying about being very clear on what's deeply important to you, but also having a willingness to source yourself from a place of love for something, using humble confidence, rather than the fear of something where you can be triggered by ego. So controlling that ego is so important. Fascinating. If we're looking at you know, leadership over the last few decades, and you've been examining it, you've been experiencing yourself, has this evolved at all? You know, the different questions of leadership or leadership styles, in other words, do, can we expect leadership to continue evolving? Or is this something that as humanity, we're sort of converging on this idea? And this is something that has taken us, you know, since the beginning of human nature, and, and will continue to be to be this pretty much with the same principles moving forward. I, I think, um, the finesse of it might change. The environment can change a little. But in my view, uh, the, the main tenets of, of leadership uh, hold steady throughout time. Leadership is underpinned by a clear commitment to accomplish something. And commitment, all a commitment is, is a promise we make to ourselves. It's not about contracts. You know, if you and I sign a contract, Michael, if one of us wanted to back out, we'd find a way of backing out. A commitment is only a promise that we make to ourselves to follow through. And then having the humble confidence to listen to others, as we discussed. But the last aspect of leadership, which I think is enduring, is to nurture a sense of belonging. As human beings, we are inclined to mm. belong. We want to belong. Yeah? And leaders who nurture that sense of belonging, they create an environment where people choose to step up and take responsibility. They choose to do more for the cause, whatever it happens to be, because they feel they belong. They know how their jigsaw puzzle piece can fit into the overall picture on the box. And that's when leadership really, well, starts to fly, because we find that we actually need to lead less, and uh, <laughs> our, our people don't need managing so much either. Yeah. So I yes, it, the environment might change. You know, I love it. This idea of sense of belonging. Sense of belonging is key, absolutely key. And you know, I love to compress things right down to the simplest thing. I, I'm a father now. Even if you're not a father, Michael, you've been a, a a son. Yeah, and I think parenting is one of the greatest leadership challenges any of us can face. And let's look at it. You know, when you first become a parent, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you don't know, but you are absolutely committed to bringing up your children and having them continue forward, honoring those things that you feel are deeply important. Yeah. You are willing to step into the unknown, even when you don't know the answers. You have the humble confidence to ask others, whether it's your, your, your friends, your own parents, uh, siblings who have got kids to figure out how to bring up your children. And it's an enduring commitment which stays with you until the day that you die. So, you know, I think great leadership starts as a parent, great leadership starts at home, and the fundamental aspects of leadership have not changed over the centuries. Incredible. Peter, I really want to thank you for your time and your energy and for the amazing work that you're doing you know, I really, really in the way that I'm saying it, advance humanity and advance, you know, us. And uh, at the end, you know, being a good leader is not just about improving our own lives, but it, it's about empowering all those Absolutely. around us. And I can only hope for myself to, to, to be able to harness some of the things that, that you're talking about here, like humble confidence and, and, and creating a sense of belonging and putting ego aside and, and being much more curious, but truly, truly curious and being reflective. So I'm taking a lot of these concepts from this conversation and uh, it was short but it was very meaningful to me so thank you very much peter and i look forward to reading the book myself leading from the jump seat and then the incredible journey that you've been on so thank you very very much and stay safe and stay healthy my absolute pleasure nice talking to you michael take care